okay? Well, welcome to Jesus and Coffee. And I hope you have your coffee, but if you don't like coffee, it's okay. You don't have to have coffee. You can have like uh, juice, tea, um, water uh, if you want to be a little bit healthier. But what I'm going to say is grab your coffee. It's time to go. And if you all recognize this mug, deacons. Well, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about, about Jesus and Coffee evaluating priorities. Now, I want to explain these Bible series of Bible studies. Have you ever asked anybody out for coffee, for for tea, hey, let's go to Starbucks, and because you really, really want to talk to them? Well, that's what this is about. I really, really want to talk to you, and uh, this is kind of like a come to Jesus meeting. Have any of you all ever had a come to Jesus meeting? I have. Um, yeah, like where he told me, just this, this, this is the way it is, and uh, either you follow me or you don't. And this is one of those things where we're, we're talking about, and this is linked in with our sermon series, Shift, and where we got to evaluate our priorities. And today we're going to be evaluating our priorities. Now, you know, uh, there's a cost to being a disciple. Now, let me let me take a drink. Mm. And let me put this to the side so I don't drop it because I get too excited. Now, I want to say that uh, there's a cost to being a disciple. You know, probably right now on the news, you can see people who, who claim to be Christians. You can see actors who claim to be Christians. You can see musicians who claim to be Christians. But they're not doing Christian-like things. You know, you have people who are in placed uh, in, in power, but uh, they say they're, they're, they're Christians, but all of a sudden their behavior shows something different. Now, and that's, that's what Jesus and Coffee is. It's a come to Jesus meeting, and today we are evaluating our, our priorities. So I actually want to start off with uh, Luke 14, 25 through 35, and then I'm going to be reading out of the NLT. But before we jump into that, hey, take this time, go share us on Facebook, go share us on YouTube, uh, tag this link, put it on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you want, and just start saying, you know what, uh, hashtag uh, my church is on fire for God, you know. Hashtag my church is on fire for God. And it's really important you start sharing this because if you're not sharing it, you're not doing your part. It's so easy to share. This is the easiest way to share the gospel is just to press like, share, and then just share it. It, it doesn't get any easier. I'm sure the disciples would have loved this. You know, what could they have done with the internet and social media? Well, uh, when we jump into this, I've given you plenty of time to share this. Uh, but this is, uh, it's in, in the Bible, it's, called, it's, it's titled The Cost of Being a Disciple. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let me read this to you. This is Luke 14, 25 through 35. And it says, A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, This is Jesus turning around and speaking. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there is a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. <laughs> so, sorry, I think it's funny because Jesus just said that. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is so far away. So you cannot be... be Become my disciple without giving up everything you own. 34 says, salt is good for seasoning, but it lose, if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for a manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So I'm going to say, if you have ears to hear today, you should listen and understand. Some of y'all may think, man, uh, Pastor Sam has gone off the cra crazy end. I didn't go off the crazy end. I'm just reading to you what Jesus said. Jesus said that you wouldn't even be good enough for manure if you didn't follow him, right? It's crazy, right? And then he laughs at you. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, that, that, that it, it, okay, well, I'll let that go, but let me pray for you and we'll get started. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you because you've given us a wonderful opportunity to stop what we're doing, stop in our tracks and, and say, thank you, God because you were so good to us that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for us. 
specifically for our sins, to wash them away so that we, we may be back with you together again. Father, we do this in your name I pray. Amen. Not a woman. Let me just stop real quick and say the cost of discipleship is understanding when there's people out there saying things that they're Christians and they don't even know what they're talking about. And if you don't know what they're talking about, then you know what? Become a disciple. Start learning this stuff because there's a lot of people out there preaching the wrong gospel. Now, am I saying I'm always right? No, I'm not always right. But the gospel is. And, and this whole thing about people using Christ's name, you know, when the Bible says don't use my name in vain, I really do believe that they're using the Lord's name in vain. So we live in a crazy world. And there's a cost to discipleship is where you separate yourself from those things and you follow Jesus Christ. And that's what we're trying to get together today. I couldn't, I couldn't help but talk about that today. But let's start out with an ice cream breaker, right? Let's chill out for a little bit. So if you were on a TV so if, if you were on a, a TV game uh, TV game show, basically, how would you try for the 50,000? Uh, would you try for the 50,000 grand prize, even though you might lose 25,000 you had won so far and why? So basically, you have $25,000, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden they say, but you know what? You can go for you can go for 50,000. But if you get it wrong, you lose everything now. Whew, it's a hard decision, right? Now, now me, when I was younger, I probably said, man, let's do this. Let's do 50,000. Let's go. No, let, let's do it, right? But now I'm a little bit older and I'm like, mm, I don't know, man. You know what? I sure have lost a lot, you know, uh, jumping to conclusions and thinking I like I should be able to win a lot. But I think currently I would be with the 25,000. Why? Because I know that's a guarantee. And, 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 and the thing is, is that um, where would you be at? Uh, tell me, 25,000, 50,000. Yeah, just, just, just write 25 or 50 in the comment section so that way I know uh, uh, who likes to take leaps of faith. Now, here's the thing. When we compare this to Christ, you know, you don't know what the life will bring when you follow Christ. See, but the thing is, is that, like, I can't say that where I say, you know, when I was younger, I might have done it. Now I'm older, I evaluate my priorities. You see, I would still take that, that leap of faith in Him. Why? Because I've seen him prove himself over, over, and over, and over again to me, even despite him not even need, needing to prove himself to me. So, let me know where you're at. Well, to begin our questions, to begin to begin our dialogue here, we're going to be talking about who is on first. So, who is on first? Like, who's on first base? Like, who, who should be first in your life, right? But based on Luke 14, 25-35, what is Jesus saying about our family? Now, when you talk about who's on first, sometimes they say, man, but my family, Pastor. I say, you know, I know that, right? I have a family. You have a family. And, and I know the importance of family. But see, normally there is no conflict between loving Christ and our family members also. But sometimes a tug of war develops where a family member puts pressure on us to back off from or even abandon our love for Christ. So there's times where your family might, I mean, gosh, I remember being, uh, when I was a youth pastor, we had one young lady in uh, in our youth group, and she's already a junior in high school, and where, you know, where she went home, and she's like, uh, she's like, I'm afraid to go home after church because I've accepted Christ, and I have to tell my parents. But when I tell my parents, my, my, my family might kick me out of the house. Now, that was going on to like a 16, 17-year-old little girl, right? Now, uh, sometimes that would happen within you and your family. But in those difficult situations, we do not love either Christ or the family member if we submit to the pressure. See, we do not love the family member because if we bow to the pressure, we are saying that Christ is not worthy of being followed above all others. And if we keep the family member from ser and and also we're going to keep that family member from from seriously considering the claims of Christ. So they're going to say, "What kind of Christ do you have if I just say that and you abandon them?" Have you ever been in that situation? If you have, say, "Man, I've been in that situation before." Also, we do not love Christ because we have put a sinful human being who did not give himself or herself for our sins in a higher place than the spotless Lamb of God who freely offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. Wow, that person just became an idol, right? You know, you know when, when, you, den when you deny Christ, when you push him aside because of that girlfriend, when you push him aside because of that boyfriend or that man or, or that or that person that you're just so in love with and you have to get married with them, but they're you're unequally yoked. No wonder you have so much trouble being a true disciple. No wonder you have so much trouble evaluating your priorities when you're trying to live a life of Christ, when you have someone who is pulling and tugging you away. And if they're pulling and tugging you away and you fall for it, then you you were never a follower of Christ to begin with. 
Now, <clears throat> Jesus uses a strong word in here, and and but what he what does he mean by that strong word? Hate, right? Hate. You know, I was raised. I. I Though I wasn't allowed to say hate, you know, I strongly dislike, right? Even my girls, I say, don't use that word hate. It's too strong. But here, Jesus uses it, right? Well, you might call his statement a hyperbole or even an oxymoron or a paradox. You know, for sure, it serves as a shocking declaration designed to get our attention as it amplifies his unavoidable, unavoidable determination to have us give him an undistracted, undiluted, unwavering passion focused on himself and himself alone. So, I know when I preach, there's some things that I say that are just shocking to you. You know what I mean? Like, like this last week, if you didn't listen to last week's sermon, go watch it. You're probably going to be like, whoa. Here's the thing. Jesus needed to get their attention, right? And if Jesus, if God is love, what is the opposite of love? Hate, right? And, 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 and does he not have every right to expect this from us in light of all that's included in the five truths that I just mentioned. Now, unavoidable determination. It amplifies, right? Uh, undistracted, undiluted, unwavering passion focused on himself and himself alone, right? And and yes, he has every right to expect that from us. He came and died from us. He stepped down from his throne, came down, died while we didn't, we weren't even worth it. We're still not worth it and he still loves us. And, you know, in other words, because of who he is and all he is right now, he deserves to have the full measure of our heart's uh, capacity, our heart's capacity. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, uh, when you fill your heart with God, you're like, well, if I fill him with, with that, how would I love anybody else? But because God is love, when you fill his love in your heart, you love others. And I think some people are afraid of that. They're afraid to fill themselves with God's love because they don't ever know what what it's like <laughs> you know it's weird because you know i've had op opportunities to get lasik surgery right and um and it it's uh, I've, I've worn glasses so long and i've been in the lifestyle of wearing glasses where <laughs> there's it, it, like i take off my glasses and i put them i put them on my bed at night and as soon as i wake up i put them straight on that's the very first thing i do i hear my alarm go off but before i even get to my alarm because i can't see where to push I put my glasses on and I've lived with glasses so long that uh, I was afraid. This might sound the most ironic thing. I was afraid to get light LASIK, uh, but now I found out LASIK isn't forever. So I'm like, I'll just wear glasses. I was afraid to get LASIK because I didn't know what it would be li like not to wear glasses. And as weird as that sounds, as uh, dumb and little and minute that that sounds, well, you're, because you're afraid what it'd be like to not wear glasses. Yeah. I don't know why, but when you think of Christ, there's some people that are afraid to follow him and because they've never really, they've been, they, they, they were saved and, and they came to that moment, and, but they were saved and they lived so far apart from him, they don't know, understand really the cost of following and being his disciple. See, in other words, like I, I mentioned, because of who he is and all he is right now, he deserves to have a full measure of our heart's capacity. You know, since scripture assures us that Jesus has been placed in the position of supremacy and everything out of Colossians 1.18, that means that everything and everyone, every affection and every allegiance should be all about him alone. All about him alone. And you're wondering, well, what about, yeah, for me, yes. For, I, I mean, I, I couldn't be preaching to you this stuff if I didn't follow it myself. And here's the deal. Some of us will give that allegiance till it comes against something that maybe pushes and hurts our feelings. Well, you know what? I, as a pastor, I don't, it doesn't bother me to hurt your feelings because it's not me hurting your feelings. These are the scriptures. And I keep quoting Francis Chan, but every time, like he, he mentioned that every time he comes up into the Bible and he reads something and he disagrees with it, he automatically has to think that he's in the wrong. And that's where we are today. That, that we, we, want, we, we want all of Jesus, but we don't want to give him all of us. You know, and I'm just going to read this again. There, uh, since scriptures assures us that Jesus has been placed in the position of supremacy in everything, that's out of Colossians 1.18, that means that everyone and everything, every affection and every allegiance should be all about him alone. So let me just tell you, all these people that are using, believe me, we will be judged. All these people that are using his name for their agenda, whew, man, that means that their allegiance is to this, but they're using a little bit of him to get it. So therefore, 
justifiably he seeks, he being Christ, from all who call him Lord and all-consuming love that, and here's the key to unlocking the mystery of Luke 14.26, by contrast, is so deep and so wholehearted that it is as every other human relationship ends up looking like hatred. I repeat, by contrast, right? Not that we're going to be like, I hate you. No. You are who you are, but because God is love, I love you. Not because I love you that I love God, right? I'm not going to lie. Oops, I almost dropped my pen. I'm not going to lie. This gets me This gets me excited. There are some of us out there that, uh, how many of y'all have ever gone to church because of a girl, right? And, and you're going for the wrong reasons. And then there's some who just, Man, all of a sudden they don't go out the girls anymore or the the girl goes because of a boy and stuff like that and all of a sudden they had no interest in church because their, their interest was never there. But those, you'll see, the long-lasting relations are the ones who put God first and put Christ first in their life. And all of a sudden that that's sustaining. And um, like I said, you're not going to hate on people, right? You're not going to be like, because I love Christ, I hate you. No, you're not doing that. What you're doing is say, because I love Christ first, that I understand how to give real love to those who Christ loves. So, pretty harsh words, right? The word hate. But what did he mean by carrying a cross? Carrying a cross. And we hear that, you, you know, as preachers, you got to bear, and they'll pound their pulpit, you got to bear your cross, right? And you're like, okay, um, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I'll bear a cross. Do you really know what it means to bear a cross? See, Jesus' audience was well aware of what it meant to carry one's own cross, See, when the Romans led a criminal to his execution site, he was forced to carry the cross in which he would die. You know, in modern terms, they're making you dig your own grave, right? See, this showed up, this showed his submission to Rome and warned observers that they had better submit too. Jesus spoke to the teaching to, to the, get the crowds to think through their enthusiasm for him. So he encouraged those who were superficial either to go deeper or to turn back. Following Christ means total submission to Him, perhaps even to the point of death. I, I, gosh, I talk about a lot of times that I hope that my life shows enough evidence that if there was a persecution that took place, that I would be able to be persecuted because they knew I was a Christian, that there was enough evidence that I was a Christian. That even if I said, no, nah, I don't know, they say, nope, look, evidence shows you have a you have an uh, unfailing love for your God. And you know, that's what Jesus is saying right now, that despite what the world will do to you, you need to be able to show that you would follow me to the grave just as I saved you from the grave. They knew in Jesus' time what it meant to bear the cross, but we've lost it in the time where we're so lukewarm and so numb to the to the point of what death is that that yes, I'm gonna bear my cross, but gosh, only on Sunday mornings, you know, Sunday mornings, and I'll I'll get there just in time or a little bit out of I, I know I'm late, Pastor, but you know, when when you should be getting the church well with enough time to be able to serve Christ, you know. Uh, or are you you're out there like, well, you know what? I just, yeah, I got a real busy schedule. Well, you know what? Like, why why are you willing to accept this busy schedule when you're not willing to accept God's plan for your life? Maybe if you accepted his plan for his life, your schedule wouldn't be so hectic because he would make your path straight, like the Bible says. You know, and I, and I know this sounds, and I, I know I'm bumping heads. You know what? But like like my wife says, if you're not bumping heads with the devil, then you're walking in the same direction. And that's the thing. If you're going through life and everything is so awesome and you're not participating in church, I'd be, I'd be worried. I mean, I'd honestly be worried. And and I, 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 it wasn't a New Year's resolution, but it was just a motivation that I felt God spoke to me through His Spirit and said, you know what, don't hold back in 2021. Because... Partially, maybe you holding back even the slightest bit and and your urgency, your exhortation, and, and, and your pleading with people to understand who I am. Maybe there's some people that left this world without knowing who I am. And man, that scared me. Wow. I know as a pastor, I'll be judged even harder than your regular church member, right? But we will all be judged. And that's the thing. 
if, if, if you're going to bear his cross, you're going to go through things, you know, you know, do I have all the same friends in high school? No college. No, do, do, what do I'll, I'll say this, um, though I, I expect it. Oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is, this is going to be my life and all this stuff. And I'm not saying that my life right now is bad or anything like that, but what I projected my life to be was, you know, world famous drummer, right. And musician doing all this stuff and just living that life. And then I realized that because I followed Christ, he actually saved me from that life that I was going to go towards. Why? Because if I would have went towards that life, I'd still try to be living that life. I know where those people are at right now. <laughs> you ever see those pictures on Facebook? Oh, wow, look at this guy. He looks great. He's 21, and he looks like a super old man. Yeah, that would have been, been me because I would have just been running life ragged. But you know what? I, I said, you know what? I'm going to bear my cross. But because I'm going to bear my cross, I know that Scripture says that uh, he will make my path straight. And because he made that path straight that I followed this path, then I'll say I met my wife, I met, I have my children, I have my life going right now. And people says, well, it's not what you planned it out to be. No, but it's perfect because it's what God planned it out to be. And I think a lot of y'all are afraid of that right now because you're afraid of what it will look like if God completely transforms your life in him. Why? Because you've never experienced it. But pastor, I'm saved. Are you really saved? If you were really saved, your life would be dramatically different. And I, I realized that one time. Man, if I am who I'm saying I am, why am I still doing these dumb things? Why am I still falling in temptation to these things? Because if you're a follower of Christ, you'll be a radical follower of Christ. So when he says, will you bear my, will you, will you bear my cross? Yes, I'll bear your cross. And you know what? Even so much for that, I would love to carry your cross for you. So, what do each of these three parables tell us about how to give our lives to Jesus? There's one word, completely, okay? Now, how do we give our lives? Completely. Now, some of you are like, oh, that's a simple word. No, well, you know what? Completely is an adverb that comes from the Latin completus, to fill up, okay? I'm going to start giving definitions out there because apparently somewhere in D.C. people are using the wrong words. We use it to mean entirely or wholly. So Congress, Senate, whoever y'all are, if you need help with word or verbiage, give me a call. I'll help you out. So if a building is completely destroyed, right, no part of it is left standing. Reading a newspaper story or watching a documentary film completely means you finish it from beginning to end. I believe that if people were completely following God, our world will look much different. Now, I'm not getting in front of the prophecies that say it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, it is. I'm talking about people who are in the church, people who say they profess God, but they're still bringing the world into the church. Well, this is the way I do it. Well, no, that's not the way you do it at church because this is the body of Christ. If you're following him, you wouldn't let your selfishness come into it. And I'm speaking about everybody. And the thing is, is that we're okay with it. Oh, get over it, pastor. Uh, that's this. That's no, 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 no. You know what? <laughs> There's that song. This is my father's world, right? And it starts out like that. And this is my father. He created it. And then God left us in charge him to be good stewards of it. And because Christian, and I'll, I'll read this in a little bit. I'll, I won't. I'm not going to chase rabbits. So completely. How are we able to give our life to Jesus? Completely. So what does the salt analogy emphasize about discipleship? Now, a lot of us have heard about salt, right? I'm sure you've heard of salt sermon. You've heard uh, we want to be the salt of the world. Yes, pastor. Amen. We're going to be the salt of the world. But here, do you really know what it means? So salt was used as a preservative. You know, it is the earliest of all preservatives. You know, the Greeks even used to say that salt could put a new soul into dead things. Now, without salt, things petrified and went bad. See, with its freshness, was, it was preserved. That means that true Christianity must act as a preservative against the corruption of the world. Do we get that? True Christianity must act as a preservative against the corruption of the world. That if we're in the world, we're not adding to the sin. We're not adding to the... I was going to say a word in Spanish, but I don't know if it's a bad word or not, so I better not use it. We're not adding to just this crazies out there, like my grandma said. You know, there's the crazies out there. you got to be careful. And, and the thing is, is when we walk into there, we're walking in holy ground is... Being, so when we walk into a situation, we should be preserving it into a uh, a, a time of peace, a time of justice, a time of, uh, of revival. You see, the individual Christian must 
be the conscience of his of his or her fellows, and the church the conscience of the nation. The Christian must be such that in his his or her presence, no doubtful language will be used, no questionable stories told, no dishonorable actions suggested. See, the number one pitfall that people don't come to church is Christian hypocrisy. And you know the bad part of that is that they think that that's Jesus. And that's not Jesus. That's humanity there. Humanity's failure. So if we're going to be a part and we're going to uh, realize and, and, and analyze where we're supposed to be as Christians, the Christians must be such that in his or her presence, no doubtful language will be used, no questionable stories told, no dishonorable actions suggested. So in Christ, you know, he must be like a, a cleansing antiseptic in a circle in which he moves. The church must fearlessly speak against all evils and support all good causes. You know, you know the church must never uh, hold uh, peace through fear or favor of men. There's times that people kick back, and I'm going to tell you, as your pastor, I'm guilty of it, man. I don't, I don't like getting involved into political things because then people think I'm siding with this side and this side and this side. But what I'm telling you, what's going on in our government, what's going on in our nation, we're, and you know what? I'm going to tell you the bottom part of this, and if you want to click me off, click me off, but this is what it is. People are starting to change verbiage. Now, I've had this conversation about two or three months ago with my dad. Now, and we're sitting, we're sitting at that table right there. And I said, you know what I think the problem is, is that people think that they can just change what a word means. Okay. Now, all of a sudden is a riot is a peaceful march where they're busting things apart. Right. All of a sudden, uh, <laughs> they're turning, uh, so be it, a man into a woman. And that just happened. And the weird thing is when they were doing it, I believe I was preaching on, on this stuff. Uh, or, or they're changing uh, where you cannot call a man a man and a woman a woman or to be a manly man, uh, an honorable man, it, it, that's wrong. And you, to be a woman, and, and they're changing things. And you know what? It was one thing when they were just trying to change generalities, but now they're trying to change the word of God and manipulate it into the what is should be and beneficial for them. And what you know the crazy thing is, everything that is going on, they, they know that if they use the word of God, because it's such a powerful, right? It's a, it's a powerful sword. The, the Bible is a sword that they're turning it into something that it's not. So as Christians, we need to hold our ground. We need to make sure that we stand up for something. And I told you, I am guilty of that. And believe me, you're going to see my opinion a whole lot more. Why? Because like I said, it wasn't a resolution or anything. It was just God really pounding me in the forehead and saying, what have you been doing? Like I said, I'm preaching to myself. I'm not asking you to do anything that I wouldn't ask you to do, that I wouldn't do myself, I'm sorry, or that Jesus wouldn't ask you to do. And that's the power in this, this three parables that he's talking about. Okay, I'll move on. Sorry. So salt was used as flavoring food. Uh, flavoring. Food without salt can be revolting and bland. Okay, so the Christian then must be the man who brings flavor into the life, Right. The Christianity, which which acts like a shadow of, of, of gloom and a wet blanket, is no true Christianity, right? The Christian man, who is by his courage, his hope, his cheerfulness, and kindness, brings a new flavor to life. Now, I know sometimes th this this sounds like, like I'm getting upset, and yeah, I kind of am, but when you enter someone's life, you and, and you're a Christian, and you're an ambassador for Christ, you are bringing the hope, peace, love joy, calmness, you're a chain breaker, you're, uh, you, you're, you're, you're uh, liberating those uh, from, from everything that has been oppressing them. You're coming, and because the blood of Christ is in you, you're coming, and you're being an ambassador and sharing that blood with someone else. People's lives should be changed every time you talk to them. Why? Because you should be sharing the gospel with them. And out of all descriptions of sand, I mean, salt, listen to this one. So salt was used on the land. It was used to make it easier for all good things to grow, right? You know, and when I study this stuff, you know, I I, I really didn't, I, honestly, I until I was working on this, I really didn't think much about that. See, the Christian must be such that he makes it easier for people to be good and harder to be bad. We all know people who, who's, uh, in whose company there are certain things we would not or could not do. And equally, we all know people in whose company we might well stoop to things which by ourselves we would not do. 
So there are fine souls in whose company it is easier to be brave and cheerful and good. The Christian must carry with him a breath of heaven in which fine things flourish and the evil things shrivel up. So you know what? I hope when I preach to you, man, you're on fire. I hope after you watch this Bible study, you're on fire because I want to do everything possible as a Christian man to, to, to help kindle that fire you got going in you. I remember, uh, as some of y'all may like Kirk Cameron, some of you might not, but I guess what? He's bold in his faith and he's doing something. Here's the deal. I was at a, a YEC, a youth evangelism conference, and it was one of the very first conferences I went to. And uh, it was, gosh, years, years ago. And I remember the, the youth pastor said, hey, Sam, you want to go with us to a conference? I was like, yeah, I guess whatever. And I remember Rebecca St. James was, was uh, playing, Salvador played, and then uh, we, and then one of the big guests was Kirk Cameron, and he was going to be speaking. And after, after, uh, man, after he finished speaking, you, you got to remember this is a youth evangelism conference, and we're in Dallas, Texas, in the old Mavericks. Do you know the, the name of the old Mavericks building? I don't know. It, it's a place where losers go to play. Go Spurs. Anyways, <laughs> it's humongous, right? And I remember they had they had a, uh, a true love weights rally, and it was it was crazy. They were doing crazy stuff there, right? They separated the boys, moved us to some other place. We all came back. Kirk Cameron started speaking, man, pumped, right? And I remember him saying, he goes, he goes, you know what? I want to be so on fire for God that it lights your fire. And I pray as your pastor that I'm so on fire for God that man that if you're next to me, you can't help but turn on fire. And that because that you're on fire too, that people next to you can't help but turn on fire. You know, hashtag turn on fire. Let's make that trending. So here's the deal. You should be changing lives whenever, you know, and, and, then, and then evil things should suppress around you. You should burn them, right? Uh, one of the cool things is like, you know, when, they, when they, they go and they'll burn a field, right? And they burn that field. So what? To get rid of all the bad stuff so the good things can come back, the nutrients can come back in a field when you're planting and, and growing uh, crops. That's what we should be. And then we come and we water it with, with, with the blood of God, with His Holy Spirit, with His Word, and then amazing things grow up. So in summary, what kingdom values are taught? So see, the values that are being taught is the function of the Christian. If he fails in his function, there's no good reason why he should exist at all. And we have already seen that in the economy of God, uselessness invites disaster i'm going to read this again because you know what i didn't i didn't write that i borrowed that off a, a concordance right uh one of some of my books that have information in them so i'm going to i'm going to read this again because this is like powerful this is not coming from me this is coming from like a way smarter pastor so uh if this upsets you it was him and i'm just delivering the message anyway here you go in summary what kingdom values are taught here so the values that are being taught is the function of the christian telling you what a Christian should do. If he fails in his function, there is no good reason why he should exist at all. If you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, and you're failing in your function, it's better that you don't exist. And we have already seen that in the economy of God, uselessness invites disaster. Here's the deal. Don't blame others when you fail at being a Christian. This is your deal. This is you and God. And if you're wondering why your life is 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 not working out and, and here's the thing like i this is my disclaimer just because you become a christian doesn't mean your 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 um, life's gonna be all hoop to do but if if you're wondering why things like you can never be at peace whenever your life goes weird you know it's be, it's because uselessness invites disaster if you're busy in christ you don't have time to be messing with that girl or that guy who's leading you astray if you keep yourself so busy in christ you don't have time to to wonder about, why did she leave me? I can't. Be. No, no, no. If, if you're busy in Christ, you all, all you're focusing is on Christ. And guess what? The harvest will come. The harvest will come. It's like right now I'm dreading the grass growing back in the front yard. I have um, I have a Brady Bunch backyard. It's AstroTurf in the back. But in the front yard, man, weeds like crazy. I know they're coming back. They're, they're peeking in. And I know it's going to take a lot of hard work, even though like there's not, but they're going to show up like in the next couple of weeks. And it's going to be a uh, back knee breaking work, trying to get those things out to make sure that that things grow. And that's the same thing right now. It's the same thing right now. And some of this may be 
they think like, oh, this is, man, this is tough talk from pastor. This isn't from me. This is from Jesus. So we have to ask the question, why such talk, tough talk from Jesus? And, and this is the answer. It says, why? Because it is possible to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple, to be a camp follower without being a soldier to the king, to be a hanger on in some uh, great work without pulling one's weight. You can be going to a church that can be thriving, but you're not doing your part. And you think you are in the midst of, of, of serving, and all you are is a Sunday attender. All you are is, is like, like the... Like this, like the the Sandlot. That's the name of that movie. All you are is a mouth breather. That's all you are. And I I can't emphasize it enough, folks. But this is how important the kingdom of God is, and this is how important that we need to move forward. With it is just don't be a mouth breather in Christ, right? <laughs> They'll just be there, like I had to. I saw the Sandlot the other day. Anyways, here's the deal: that you can you can be a, a hanger in some great work, but you're not pulling your weight. You see, once someone was talking to a great scholar about a younger man, he said, so and so tells me that he was one of of, of your students. You know, the teacher answered uh, devastatingly. He said, he may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. It is one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in it, there are so many distant followers of Jesus Christ and so few real disciples. I know, like, my wife, she goes, oh, I said, yeah, I know, right? Like, see, it is the Christian's first duty to count the cost of following Christ. So if you're going to follow Christ, count the cost. Understand, it's no longer about you anymore. It's not about me. See, the tower which the man was going to build was probably a vineyard, you know? Vineyards were often equipped with towers from which watch was kept against thieves who might steal the harvest. An unfinished building is always a humiliating thing. So, it, how, how do I explain this? In, in, in biblical times, you know, they didn't have like that, that, that home security system where you'd watch it on your iPhone and stuff like that. No, they had to keep watch. It was, when they're talking about keep watching the vineyards and stuff like that, um, they would build these towers where they could see over it. And, and, and I would say, like, like, just go to the front of the church, look out, and you'll see a hill like that. So they would have built something on a hill to be able to watch. And what they were doing was, like, they were looking for the enemy. They were looking for the enemy. See, and, and, and they had to know if they were going to come and, and steal their harvest. And right now, believe me, as a pastor, I am making sure that no one comes and steals their harvest. You know, and, and this is true in every sphere of life. You see, a man is called upon to count the, cross, the cost. And in the introduction, okay, this is a real cool story that I read. In the introduction to the marriage ceremony, according to the forms of the Church of Scotland, the minister says, Marriage is not to be entered upon lightly or unadvisedly, but thoughtfully, reverently, and in the fear of God. And a man and woman must count the cost. And a man and woman must count the cost. When people are led to Christ and I'm involved in that process, I explain to them that just like how marriage is forever, so is giving your life to Jesus. You know, because it is that way with the Christian way. But if a man is daunted by the high demands of Christ, let him remember that he is not left to fulfill them alone. He who called him to the steep road will walk with him every step of the way and will be there at the end to meet him. Folks, he's not going to leave you alone. This is not an impossible task to become a... to count the cost what it would be to, to be a disciple. You know, this is a hard talk. This is a hard talk to give. This is, this is, this is like me standing here or sitting here really with my coffee right saying we need to be our biggest critics we need to evaluate ourselves we need to make sure that going forward that we we are the fire that that lights these uh fires of, of people in christ right it's a hard talk because it's a hard walk you, you know we've seen the movies or maybe even some of y'all have been there where they say you're going in the battle look at the person next to you look at the person next to you know that one of them will not make it out See, but Christianity shouldn't be that way. It's going to be hard. We are going into battle, right? 
contemplating this is how I fight my battle, right? There's a brotherhood and sister, a sisterhood in Christianity that helps us lift each other up. And so many times when we're trying to lift each other up in Christ, others see it as that we're trying to put them down or hold them behind. And this is what this, these verses are speaking about. If you can't take what Christ is telling you right now, you won't be able to take what's coming. And I believe that's an important message. If you can't take what the scriptures I read to you are telling you right now, you won't be able to handle a future in Christ. So you, not, you need to count the cost of discipleship right now. This is not a message to turn you away. This is a message to let you know that it is worth it. That's what someone needs to tell woke culture right now. You're taking the easy way out. There's no better feeling than fin finishing something that was just, you know, it was difficult. It was, it was hard to get through. But you know what? When you get through it, you get to the other side, you're just like, man, I'm stronger for it. So I have this question, and the question reads like this. It says, when did you realize that following Jesus Christ was costly? How so? You know, I think it was the first time I moved to San Antonio. The first time I moved to San Antonio, I would largely to say, like, I was mostly by myself. You know, my parents still helped out, but I was mostly by myself. I'd never really been anywhere largely by myself before. More or less a big city. I got lost all the time. You know, um, there was times when I was in seminary, man, I just felt like all by myself. Yeah, you're surrounded by people, but BUA mostly spoke Spanish at that time, and I didn't speak any Spanish at all. And then my friends would give me a call, and they would say, hey, we're going to go over here, we're going to gig, you want to go? I'm like, ah, I can't, I have school, I, I, can't, I can't. When I knew that, going and taking that gig would set me up. Like, it would, it would give me the funds to be able to pay school, it would give me the funds to be able to pay my apartment, to do all this stuff. And then I... And then I, I would sit there in my bed and I'd say like, well, I guess this is the, this is what it cost me. Uh, this is what it cost me. And me not knowing how I'm going to pay for food, pay for school, not doing anything. But then I remembered something like, I guess my grandfather, my, my grandmother would always say to me, like, God is faithful. God is always faithful. He will take care of you. And yeah, it did. Because when I say today that God is there to walk with you down that path, His Son, Jesus Christ, and His Holy Spirit will be guiding you. He will be guiding you. But you you, you don't know until you take that step on that path. And that's the thing is so many of y'all are afraid to take that first step. and But you're not alone. You have a church body that is with you. You have a pastor that is fully supportive of you. You, you have... You have more support than you know, so don't be afraid to jump in and take that path of the cost of discipleship. You know, some final questions that I have today. I really want you to think about this. And, um, you know, through my passionate speaking, right? Like, whew. But it's just so many people are saying so many dumb things today. So, like, I have to, have to point them out on and let you know that, like, don't believe those people. Like, you need to believe the Word of God. The final question is being a... Is being a follower or disciple of Jesus Christ worth it? I actually wrote on my paper, yes, right? I wrote, yes. Why? Because it is. And then my next question is, what keeps you going? And, and I wrote this down too. I said, having the assurance that in Christ all things have been made right. All things have been made right in Christ. So in your life right now, if, you, if things have not been made right, it's because you have not brought Christ into, into your life. And I would go so far as to say is that if you haven't fully devoted your life to Christ, did you call Him to be your Lord and Savior? And this is a get real moment. Did you call Him to be your Lord and Savior? Did, it was He Lord of your life? And He was war, war, Lord of your life. You wouldn't be doing the same things that you did before. Your life would be completely different. But I'm going to tell you, right now is the time to make a decision. If, if, if this is a decision that you need to make, and, and remember, um, sounds weird. If you're going to get married, you just don't say, hey, let's get married. I know, I know some of y'all did that. Okay, but like, it's a lifelong commitment. There's a cost to being a discipleship. It's leaving the old behind and finding the new in Jesus Christ. Now, that's you today. First, admit. Admit 
that you are a sinner. All have sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Next, believe. Believe that Jesus Christ came down from heaven, died on the cross, came back, resurrection, and ascended to heaven for our sake. And the next thing is commit. Commit your life to Jesus Christ today. So if that's you, I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. No one looking around, just, just it's you and God. If there's someone next to you, just don't pay attention. This is you and God right now. I want to pray for you. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, repeat after me. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us Jesus Christ. And because you gave, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that he came down, died on a cross, resurrected on the third day, and ascended back to heaven. Because of that, I, I commit. I ask you to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. In all of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we want to know. We want to know that, that you have joined the family of God. Why? Well, there's a cost of discipleship. You've just gained the help of a family. Right? The help of His Holy Spirit to help you. I want to pray for those who I want to pray for those who had issues with this Bible study, right? And like, oh, it's just too much. No, I, I no no. Let me pray for you that God would soften your heart, that you would become a follower, a disciple, an ambassador, and place the love of Jesus Christ first in your life. Let's pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you've given us an opportunity to know your grace, your kindness, your mercy, your justice, your, your complete adoration towards us, Father. Father, I pray for those who are still contemplating the cause, seeing if it's worth it to them, Father. Father, may they open their ears, their, may, they, may they open their hearts for those who have ears to hear, Father. May they know the love, peace, and grace of Jesus Christ that just, you know, covers all circumstances. Father, I come to you humbly today saying thank you so much for them, Father. Be with those who are sick that are just dealing with COVID, Father. Be with those who have lost loved ones to COVID, Father. Be with those who will, uh, who are still awaiting uh, test results, Father. Be with the elders to the youngest, Father. That we may uh, be ambassadors of light, of your goodness, and be salt of the earth as we've described. Father, we humble ourselves before your throne. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hey, well, that's you today. Hopefully you got to finish your coffee. I still got to work on mine. I'm still, I'm not even halfway there. But I want to make sure that you understand that uh, we got some announcements. So uh, don't forget Shift Sermon. We're going to be talking about Shift and we're going to continue talking about our mission statement, our, our vision statement for the church in 2021. Don't forget this week we have a business meeting uh, on this Sunday, the, the 10th. And it is, and don't forget, it's really important that you go by the office, check out the bylaw and constitutions that they have there on file. Uh, the church will be voting on whether to approve them or not this this Sunday uh, during our, our constitution, during our uh, church meeting. Don't forget the Lord's Supper, January 24th. Uh, it's going to be a, a great day. We're going to be breaking bread together. Don't forget we have a tentative potluck on January 31st. So we're still trying to see whether health-wise we can have it, but we went ahead and put it on the calendar. Don't forget, take time to share us on YouTube and Facebook. Click a like, subscribe, reminder, share. Tell your friends about the love of Jesus Christ. And we want to say that uh, from here on out, we'll say goodbye and we'll see you on Sunday.